Oh, I'm so glad you could join us tonight. This is the Northeast Arkansas Tea Party, and normally we have a few more people here, don't we? But tonight we're doing this on Facebook, and we've got Representatives Dan Sullivan, Representative Brent Smith, and Councilman Bobby Long to be here with us tonight. And so we're very excited that we're actually getting to meet and give everybody the kind of information that, you know, the Tea Party is known for. So, um, I thought maybe the first thing that we needed to do was to start out with the fiscal session because y'all just got finished with it here a while back before, you know, the worst of the shutdowns happened. And I thought maybe you'd let us know what was going on financially with Arkansas. Yeah. Uh, you want me to jump in that? Yeah, you go ahead and then I'll uh, correct you. Correct me? Yeah. <laughs> I trust. I mean... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, uh, yeah, we had a, a very short session. First of all, if we can accomplish what we accomplished in four or five days, one has to question the need for a 30-day session. Personally, I'm in favor of a 30-day session. You know, we didn't get to discuss much at all. Everything was cut and dried, and, and, in, and there was a need for that because we were in an emergency situation, and you have to go along with a few things just to keep the ball rolling. Uh, support our governor and support the leadership in the house and have some trust there. You know, hope everybody understands that our fiscal year ends June 31st for the 2020 fiscal year. We were $350 million short of what we needed just to finish those three months. So we took money out of uh, a discretionary, no, the a rainy day rainy fund. Day fund. And then we had uh, some surplus to make most all of that up. Uh, so we are able to finish uh, tw the 2020 fiscal year pretty much online for the budget. So what we did pass then uh, was a budget for the 2021 fiscal year, which begins here July 1st of this year for the next year. And again, just to the basics, and if people want to ask questions about specific things, I brought a copy of the budget with me to kind of look at those specific, but basically most things took a, a pretty good hit in the budget, a five to 15 percent hit. Um, you know, we tried to keep schools funded, uh, important things, the Department of Corrections funded. We tried to keep some of those uh, really necessary and critical um, budget things funded the best we can. And Arkansas has an A, B, C, and D budget line. And now we have an A1, A, B, C, D budget line. So those A budgets are fully funded. Uh, when it gets down to the B and the C, there are some cuts there. And the D budget is about $215 million. And those $215 million we don't have. That's what our shortfall is projected to be. So we hope that our economy will rebound, people will get back to work, amen. Um, our income taxes will start generating money, sales taxes will start generating money. But again, that $215 million is a projected shortfall. If we get it, those are things that we can fund. And you can find all the detail of that on the um, website for Arkansas Department of Finance. So that's that's kind of a real quick overview. Well, and, and as uh, Dan mentioned, uh, it was an abbreviated session. Uh, a lot of what we did was somewhat scripted in that there were legislators selected to make motions, read the motion. There was, I don't think there was any debate on the floor of the uh, Jack Stevens Arena where we held our fiscal session. But we all spaced out six feet and more. And uh, of course, this time around, not we had changed the rules to allow some of our members who w were considered in the higher risk categories to vote by proxy. And so their votes were counted but the rest of us that were physically there, uh, we were able to do a voice vote, and uh, sometimes it was a roll call vote, but uh, it was unlike anything that I had seen or any of us had ever been a part of. 
perhaps in the history of the Arkansas legislature. And uh, I think our leadership did as well as could be expected because no one had been through a thing like this before. But uh, Lane Jean, uh, he, uh, we, we tend to always batch several of the appropriation bills mm -hmm. and he'll, they'll be read, what is it, three times, Dan? Each bill is read three times and then Lane will ask the uh, legislators if there are, is a specific appropriation that needs to be pulled out and voted on separately and there were some of those. Um, did y'all get uh, the information about what you were going to be voting on ahead of time so that yeah. you could, you know, make some, because I know what I would be going in there cold turkey. Well, we, we weren't necessarily going in there cold turkey, but I was speaking with uh, House Majority Whip elect John Payton earlier this afternoon, and uh, I had just commented to him and he agreed that it was so different without the actual presence, uh, our presence in the budget hearings or in some of the other committees that we have during and around the fiscal session that a lot of it just didn't, it didn't feel right. That we, we went in and we voted to the best of our knowledge, but there wasn't that uh, conversation pros and cons or I'm in favor of this because or I'm opposed to a certain bill or whatever because we it was just it was a quick you know and and you know I've had people tell me I hope y'all didn't vote for something that you regret later but it's it's basically the state's money and uh, you know that's important but piggybacking off of what uh, senator-elect I should say <laughs> Dan Sullivan uh, he commented that uh, you know, these there was like A, now A1, A, B, C, D categories. And so I was thinking, as were several other legislators, if because of this projected shortfall for two months, nobody ever wants to have their budget cut or diminished 5%, 10%, maybe some were 15%, but we did it out of necessity. Why do we? Why did we have to wait for a, a a pandemic to see the necessity to to reduce some of those budgets? You know, most most of the debate is trying to add money to the budget, right? And people trying to fight the cuts, and we don't want to cut. When you see the line items, and it's minus five percent. Minus five percent. Many of us were going, to, you know, as you were saying, yeah. you know, this is what we've been fighting for. So, you know, the fight now will be, or the debate will be over, if more money comes up, how do we do that? And this is a great opportunity for us to uh, start to pare down the size of yeah, the government, streamline, and reexamine. Yeah. Well, and the thing is, and this is maybe just me, but I think it's shared sentiment among several legislators. Uh, if we can do it during a pandemic, why can't we be more resourceful and say across the board, even a modicum of a percentage cut just because we we now we know we can do it, but most agencies will come back and say, well, I only spent X number of dollars and you gave me this much, but next year I want even more. And so there's always that you didn't spend what you were allocated or appropriated. Why are you asking for more? And they're always talking about, well, there's unforeseen circumstances. And, and now we know this is an unforeseen circumstance that will allow us to make some hard decisions and some cuts. And the same thing goes for the federal government too. I believe it was Rand Paul had uh, proposed a policy of cutting the budget one or two cents per dollar. And he said within a, a fairly short period of time, you know, years, we could have a balanced budget. We could get back to where we should be and people weren't willing to do that. Of course, you know, the federal government does baseline budgeting, which is terrible, you know, for your budget. So mm -hmm. um, it's, 
that's amazing that this might even have some positive effects. I think it will have, have some positive. Yeah, what we're, what we're not calculating in this is money from the feds. In the mm -hmm. federal government, just like they injected, uh, I think it's $1.25 billion into the state of Arkansas for relief to businesses. That's not a part of our budgeting process. Mm -hmm. So that's money that we get that comes in from the feds that will help stimulate the economy but it's also at some point going to fall back on the taxpayer. You know, the feds are most likely printing this money, and at some point the taxpayer will have to make that up. Now, there, we may have another billion dollars come our way. So there's just a lot of unknowns, and uh, you know we're trying to navigate it the best we can a little bit at a time. But we do have an opportunity. Well, I think it's interesting. We need to tell people over and over and over, every nickel the state or federal government or the city government spends comes out of your pocket. Mm -hmm. yeah. There is no free money. There is no money tree out back of the White House that every nickel comes out of people's pockets. And if people ever really got that, then there might be some demands for fiscal accountability. Yeah, I agree. <clears throat> what about the city? Yeah. What kind of shape are we in here? <laughs> well, you know, when we ended the budget last year, we had a surplus and we were doing extremely well coming into this year you know but then the virus hit everything shut down you know and um, we're still in good shape you know from what the mayor had said however you know I'm not for sure what's gonna what the fall is gonna look like I mean when you start and I know we'll probably get into this about the effects of the virus and things <coughs> like that and how governments have handled it both on the state level federal level and even on the city level and I know that the curfew is going to talk, are going to come up as well. Maybe just almost, briefly. <laughs> I can almost guarantee it. But when you start pulling people away, you know, and keeping them away from each other, the virus is still out there. You know, so now you've got a bunch of people that, you know, that have not gotten it, that are not built up in communities. They're going to go back out there. They're going to get it. We'll probably end up seeing another spike in the fall. That was one of the questions that I'd raised, you know, to Dr. Spikes right. last time, last time that we, we had our city council meeting. You know, I said, well, what's, what's going to happen, you know, when we all get back to living, you know, and the virus didn't go away. It doesn't have an expiration date. December 31, it's not going away, you know, so it's going to come back out. And then what are we going to Exactly. Gonna How's do? that going to affect state businesses? I've already seen, heard of two businesses. I believe it's Front Page is not coming back. Uh, and Ruby Tuesday. Ruby Tuesday's I heard the other not. You know, when you think about all the people affected by that, the wait staff, the owners, the managers and whatnot, you know, I, and there's no telling. I mean, I don't think we've seen anywhere near the beginning of the number of businesses that are going to be affected here in Jonesboro. What does that do to our tax base? Exactly. And so, you know, I don't think you can really say for for sure what's going, what the fall's going to look like or what we're going to end up with. I know one thing, it's going to be very difficult when we do get back to work to get those that are un 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 on unemployment now getting the extra six hundred dollars trying to compete with that it's going to be difficult for employers to bring those people back because they may not want to come back you know well, you know a big part of this i think is also what discretionary income you know we may have fewer restaurants but the income the, the discretionary income that people have to go spend it will remain the same so you may have fewer restaurants to go to, but people will still be at the same number of meals served or restaurants gone. So I, I hate it that people lose their jobs and those kind of things happen. But there are just so many unknowns, and Brant mentioned it. We, you know, we just don't know what the outcome's gonna be until we start seeing what those revenues come in. And one of the outcomes, uh, one of the governors, um, he's making exceptions now, I forget, executive orders was to push back the income tax until July 15th for individuals. So that will affect our state, not in how much money we necessarily have, but it will, but in when we get the money. So we're going to have some gaps to deal with and how you fill those gaps. Um, you know, I don't think we know yet. Fortunately, we do have some reserve that will help us do that. Mm -hmm. But that's where the jobs are going to hurt us. We lose the jobs, we lose the business. Is that those the income, the disposable income that those people had? Where does that come from? Oh, and I suspect yeah. we will have uh, we'll be called into another special session down in Little Rock, because as 
those shortfalls or not so much a shortfall but lack of income right. to the state as Dan mentioned just now we're going to have to go and try to maneuver and move funds around to cover until those taxes do start rolling in and uh, some of the legislators I've spoken with seem to think that there will be at least one more uh, special session, maybe two, uh, because there are just too many unknowns. And, yeah, it's uh, kind of like what we just rolled out, the Arkansas get back to business or whatever, Arkansas open, Ar re open up for ready for business. Ready for business. You know, yeah. we saw the executive branch roll that out before the legislative branch approved it. That's a bad idea <laughs> and it doesn't work. So. Just, just to be clear on that, although they did award or, or give those approvals out, there was no money in the bank to give them any money. So businesses may have had that approved, but we didn't distribute any money. And of course now the governor came out today and added another 40 million, so there'll be a total of 55 million. For those of you that are applying, get online tomorrow at 8 a.m. and apply um, for the, that loan or that grant. Um, you have Tuesday and Wednesday to do that, but that's an example. And I think, you know, Brent and I saw it, the legislators were fairly um, energized about not being a part of that process. You know, the people elect us to be a part of it and represent them. Uh, yeah, I and, think the word is miffed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> miffed. I think it was probably, it was probably just an oversight. I don't think any ill intentions. No, but a lot of people out here would think, Wait a minute, do we have a governor or a king? Yeah. You know? yeah. <laughs> yeah. I got a question from the live feed. Uh, this comes from Shanquetta Cunningham who says, this is actually a grand time to steer funds to trade skills in the industry, e-services, professional services instead of more low-wage jobs. Livable wage for the fourth poor state in the nation is not working. How do you propose we navigate this for our citizens? Okay, how do we navigate getting more high-paying jobs? I, let me reread them. This is actually a grand time to steer funds to trade skills, industry, e-service, professional services instead of more low-wage jobs. So I'm thinking that could mean jobs and training. Yeah, well, you know, the, the grants that are out there now for businesses have a very defined purpose. You can't, we can't redirect from what the conditions that the federal government gave. So if the questioner is asking, why don't we take the 1.25 billion and redirect it over here, we can't. That's grant money, and grant money is directed, Strings. has Strings. restrictions to it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, maybe she can ask a follow-up question, what money it, does she want us to redirect? Because we are short $212 million. I don't know how we direct a shortfall to higher paying jobs. Uh, she and may be talking too about the money that we get, and especially with the training. Um, you know, we have focused, and you know, everybody here has talked about uh, focusing so much of our attention on like um, colleges and stuff instead of the training schools and the ASU. You know, the uh, uh, Newport. Yeah. That focus on on skills and yeah. see this is, would be an ideal time to focus more on that and to provide money for education for that where you get, you know, you get out in 18 months and you actually have a, a trade or a job you can get and maybe you're not as highly affected by a pandemic or by, you know, a catastrophe like this uh, in the future. Yeah, I think a big part of it is, is uh, the public demand. You know, if there are people that want a job, let us know what those jobs you want are. Um, I think our educational system at our universities and Arkansas State's one of the leaders in the uh, state about these kinds of technical skills the questioner is asking about. I would want to go there and talk with ASU about what programs that they have right now that can help us uh, do that. The other thing I'll say about A-State is they're pretty uh, uh, progressive and um, um, creative in moving in the direction where the consumer wants to go. So I think there are those opportunities, but it, you know, again, the answer to the question is, there's no money there to redirect that I'm aware of. Yeah. And if they can respond and let us know where that money is, we'll be glad to- <laughs> To go pick that. it up. <laughs> I, think, well, I think people want what the, yeah. what the questioner's I asking agree. for mm -hmm. is exactly what people want. And people also need to understand too, that that's what the problem, and you'll know this, 
part of the problem with grant funds is they all come with strings. You know, if you get a mm -hmm. grant, you do A, B, C, and D to get your grant or to continue. If you don't do A, B, C, and D, the grant goes away and you get to pay the money back. Yeah, and I'll tell you another right. part of this is Arkansas is one of the most restrictive states in the nation for licensing. So a lot of these training programs, um, you know, require different licenses and different uh, certificates. Mm -hmm. And one of the things we can do to make, give people a greater opportunity is be less restrictive on the regulations that we have and the licenses that are required gets people into the workforce. Well, I think another thing too, and I know that Jonesboro right now has a technical center. Kids from all over yes. different schools come to this and they learn different trade skills. Black River, they have multiple different types of things, aviation, auto mechanics, different things like that. But, you know, in my profession, I go to different career fairs and things like that, and I see some of the same people. There's a guy from the uh, electrical, um, what do you call it, uh, the, the guys that oversee the, you know, the electricians, the journeyman oh, electricians yeah. and things like that. And they say it's difficult for them to get young men to want to go in there, but they pay them. Journeymen, they pay them so much an hour, they get the benefits and they do all this and when they get out, they have a skill exactly. that they can go anywhere in the country and work. It's the issue is getting the kids interested enough in that trade to go into it. I'm sure plumbers are the same way, carpenters are the same way, you know. Um, so, and I know I'm a I'm the chair of the um, Northeast Arkansas Workforce Development Board, and there's money there for kids or for you know kids or adults that have been displaced or whatever that if they want to go into a trade. You know, there's money there that will pay their tuition to do it if it's a high demand trade. You know, so I think the resources are out there. We've just got to motivate, you know, our kids and let them know that, hey, you know what? You can go for 18 months, get out and have a trade and do this, or you can go for four years. And I'll be the first to say that college is for a lot of people. You know, they love it. They thrive on it. I've got one that college is, he loves it. You know, he's gonna be there eight years probably. But then I've got another who's going into a program that in a year and a half or so, he's gonna be done, but he'll have a trade. So I can see the benefits of both. I think we need both, but the resources are out there if you know where to look, and if you're, as a person, motivated to put the time, effort, and resources, and, and, and work, and elbow grease in there to get that trade. Well, with, and finish with less uh, student debt. Exactly, and that's a major that's thing a right one. now. Yep. Big thing. We had a follow-up for Senator Elect Sullivan. Shanquita says, I'm a grant writer, and yes, there are matching funds to supplement new technology and trainings for workforce development. Other states have incorporated these models. Would you be open to reviewing these models? Absolutely. Tell her to give me a call. We'll sit down six feet apart, and <laughs> we'll talk about that. But, yeah, I was going to mention, I hope people that are watching, if they have ideas, call us up. Um, I've spent all day today talking with people who, you know, have businesses and what we can do to help them uh, and progress, and that's a great idea. And anything we can do at the legislative level to help that, just let us know. All right, this one is for Mrs. Stevens and for Councilman Long. It says, Iris, Bobby, did you see that Andy Shatley declared for mayor about four hours ago? I guess they want your reaction. I didn't see it, but I heard about it. I was told by some of the people here um, that he was going to run. I think that's interesting. Yeah, I think it's interesting too. I, you know, I, um, I don't know we say. I, I'm a Facebook friend of his, and we've had a lot of discussion. Yeah. So. Yeah. So I, you know, I know that Mr. Chatley has a lot of ideas. Yeah. You know, um, I think the the trick is for the ideas that he put forth to resonate with the people. You know, and um, it's not a it's not an easy thing, you know, to do. But you just have to neither do what you say you're going to do, and be who you say you are. <laughs> right. You know, and if you do anything differently, then you're up a creek. You know, well, but, people will definitely take offense to it if you do too many things different than what you what they want you to do and yeah. what they see as a better option. But I think there's I think there's no doubt. You know that over the course of the past 12 years that there have been you know some decisions made that were 
um, proven you know, against what the majority of the people of Jonesboro wanted. And uh, I think that that's gonna, it's gonna play a significant role you know, in this election coming up in the fall. Well, I think this latest one has too, this, this curfew, which you know, I think everybody, and I've said this, I've said publicly, I've talked to the mayor, that I think everybody understood a curfew after the um, tornado, but that I thought it was an overreach for this last one, and I think um, that was not the best thing to do in that particular situation because it was so limiting that you know it gave the impression that the virus only walks at night. <laughs> and yeah. I know that's not so, and I know there are a lot of issues, but I'm just saying, yes, you consider that with the property maintenance code that was probably very ill-advised, and with a couple of the taxes that they've attempted, which were not what people wanted to see. And um, I got a message just the other day from somebody who said they were really glad at this time we didn't have the extra, the extra tax. The extra tax. Right. The, so I um, thought about that the other day. Yeah. I have but you still got one. You can still vote for the road tax. Ex well, yeah. and I wanted to ask. Her, oh no, I forgot about that. I wanted to ask her about back. That. Yeah. What, you know, we have got a catastrophe financially right now. Now, whether it comes out quickly in order for all of us, or whether we head into a great depression, you know, I don't think any of us know right now. But what do you see as the future of this tax, uh, road tax? When we are already most, you know, there are so many people out there don't even have an income. Right. You know, what do you see about that? Well, I think I'm opposed to it. Um, before the, we had the pandemic, before we had all of this, folks, there is so much money that we have and other resources we have to put towards the roads and highways that we ought to be, just like we're cutting things 1% here and 1% there and 5% there, we could have done that before and shrunk the size of government to, to fund our highways. It's not a question of do we have the money. We have the money. It's a question of priorities. And right now we have been forced to reprioritize. Uh, and I think we can still find the money to work on our highways. Um, but I just don't think it's time for our new tax. And of course, we'll see how, how strong the governor and the executive branch push this new tax. Uh, I think will be a good indication. Um, and there are people, we may have another se uh, special session coming up to raise taxes. We may find ourselves in a hole and we're going to have to raise taxes to pay for education, to pay for our uh, uh, essential services. Essential services, yeah. yeah. Would, would y'all explain the taxes and education? Because there are a lot of people don't realize how much the state budgets for education. They're the, I believe, they're the number one recipient. 60%. 60% of our state budget goes to education, and that's why I'm an educator, but I can't figure out why the palms are always out for more. It's like we're already providing 60%. Of everything from the state of Arkansas. Everything. Of every dollar. Right. Mm -hmm. Of every dollar, and it's still not enough and I just think we can do better than just ask for more and this this virus is showing us that there are places we can cut trim back be more streamlined be more efficient we talk about transparency and efficiency well this time we're forced to do it and uh, I, I haven't seen fuel prices as low as they are right now in a decade or more and if you think about it, we can't go anywhere, but gas is cheaper now than it's ever been. So really, <laughs> the three cent increase for regular fuel and the six cent increase on diesel, it's it's wiping out the benefits of what that initially exactly. meant to do. Yeah, let me qualify my 60%. I think it's something in the mid 40% for K-12. But mm -hmm. then when you add in pre-K, you add in Head Start, mm -hmm. you add in uh, higher ed. Yeah, I'm know, talking about the whole the, package. The global right. package, when the, you're the taxpayer, when you put your dollar in there, pretty, I think it's more like 57 or 58 percent, somewhere around there, is what goes to that total education package. And for the questioner a while ago, I looked it up, we're, we are cutting $11 million from education. So I don't know where the grants are coming for specifically, whether that's an educational fund, whether it's a federal grant or a state grant, 
but th those monies are going to be diminished uh, to some point. And again, I think it gets to be priorities. What's, what's important for our state in education? And we're having to make some of those decisions too. What are we going to fund? What are we not going to fund? Well, do you realize, and because uh, a friend of mine and I did educational seminars for about 20 years, and we went through this from 1991 and uh, educational, uh, all, actually all the way back to 83. And we saw the mandates that the, ed, that the state put on schools. And of course, if you're gonna put a mandate on a school, you have to add the yeah, money into fine. it. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we saw that they mandated that schools had to have certain physical plants available. And so schools spent millions on uh, improving their buildings and everything. So. You know, some of that is just because you have, you know, the state says, we want you to do this, and the schools look at you and say, but, you know, we don't have the money to do that. And then the state has, it's, it's a vicious circle, mm -hmm. to be perfectly honest. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure how much, and I was a teacher. I was a teacher for over 30 years. I'm not sure how much it improved education. I've also looked at the statistics about how we score and what our scores have been for 30 years and I'm sorry, I'm not seeing it. And there, having to, once I, I retired from teaching, and then for a few years, I went down and taught some uh, freshman English and things. And I can tell you that I was not impressed with the quality. I love the kids, but I, was, I, I had questions about mandates that the state had put on that apparently did not improve the education of the children. You know, jump back to finance real quickly. You know, Arkansas has what we call a balanced budget amendment. Right. And everybody's really proud of Arkansas. We have to balance our budget. Well, there are good things to that. The bad side of that is you have to spend all the money you get. You can't really save money uh, or spend less because we are mandated to spend it all. So there are many people that just, let's get more and let's get more and then we'll spend more. And that's what's happened in education. As we continue to add money, we just find more and more ways to spend it because that's kind of the, what our mentality has been. And the only way to shrink government and spend less money is just to give them less money and force people to prioritize uh, how we spend it. And I have a couple more questions. I'm sorry okay. to interrupt, but um, Sherry Bearden says, why is it a 40-year-old man with a college degree forced to mow lawns to pay off his student loans what is the state willing to do to help people like him find a job? And if someone works for the state of Arkansas for 35 years, do you think it's fair for them to lose their pensions? Isn't that a public service too? Go ahead. Well, when I first came home from Iraq, I had, I mean, and I had a PhD, I needed to be outside. I mowed yards. You know, I, there's a scripture that is a foundational principle in my life that basically says in all labor there's profit but mere talk leads to poverty any work that is legitimate i don't care if it's mowing lawns trimming trees or Did serving in a restaurant is honorable work and it's easier to get a better job if you have a job and so while i don't i don't think this man may want to mow yards for the rest of his life but if he's got a college degree, I'd be interested in what is the degree in. Right. Did he choose a field where the job market was good or, or, or unstable? But there are opportunities every yes. day. Uh, not, not only in Arkansas, but it may mean relocating to take a job that he's trained for. But as far as losing a pension, I don't think that's right, especially if you pay into a pension you shouldn't lose it. Uh, I, and Dan may have to, you know, correct me on this, but there are some pension plans as, as that I'm thinking of that those pension holders voted on how they wanted their money invested. And once they voted in a certain direction, that was it. They made a decision and sometimes down the road you realize, well, we made a mistake but it might not be so easy to pull back and regroup and it's, do something different. It's difficult to know how to answer the question yeah. because we don't have enough information. Yeah. But I do want to put in the, the bit about the student loans. 
And I think everybody realizes why student loans have gotten so bad. And when the government took over funding student loans and took it out of the private businesses, that's when we saw this huge increase yeah. in the amount of money. Now, it's been bad all along because even the banks and whatnot, they were willing to loan money, and too many people did not have the economic um, education that would cause them to realize, you know, if you if you borrow $120,000 to get your education, you're eventually going to have to pay that back. And so what happened was they, I think a lot of people were really, um, I don't want to say fooled because that makes them not look, you know, smart, but I don't think they understood the repercussions. I know, yeah. you know, I have known relatives that, you know, have been in a, in a bad situation because the job market went down, their salary well, went down. Well, and some of those uh, those mm -hmm. student loans were deferred as long as yes. they were in a course yes. or in a university or in a job setting. that was, yes. they wanted and to so do. then, uh, all of a sudden, what was maybe a $100 a month payment ballooned to say $400. Mm -hmm. And then after a certain number of months after that, mm -hmm. it may have gone to 1200 or 1300 And mm -hmm. that's where some people were able to pay up to a certain point mm -hmm. based on income. But all of a sudden it doubled or tripled and it was like, that's more than I make. Exactly. Mostly, you know, yeah. in a in a pay period. Right. Well, I think and, it's hard to, to blame the government because someone took a loan. They made a personal decision to take a loan. And then it's hard to blame the government if you took a college course and a degree that uh, your salary is only going to be $20,000 a year, but you made that decision to go into that field. You can't blame the government for that. And you can't, the government can't be expected to bail people out when they made poor decisions. Uh, and life yeah, sometimes can be hard. I like, I like to, well, I'd like to talk to whoever, whoever, whoever lost their pension, they need to give us a call and let's we'll see if we can help remedy that. That's a valid point. Well, here's another gentleman who I think uh, definitely will want to talk to you once I read his comment. This comes from David Smock, who says, I'm a double amputee confined to a wheelchair. I have my associate's degree, graduated with honors. I had to drop out while trying to get my bachelor's. I'm now living on SSI of $760 a month. I have been advised by people in the medical field, including my therapists, social workers, and others to not get a job because the fear is I will lose my Medicaid. What are my options to get out of poverty? Well, I think they need to get that uh, specific question. Give us a call. You know, our numbers are open. They're out there. Just give us a call. Let's talk about that. We, people can ask very specific questions until we dig into the detail. But we help people like that every day. Uh, many people call with, with problems with Medicaid, problems with Medicare, health problems. Uh, you know, just give us a call and we'll be glad to sit down and try to figure that out. All right, the next question, why are you all considering cutting taxes for public schools? I don't know that anyone said they were going to cut taxes for public schools. So that was a comment. I think they went back to, they were talking about the reduction, you know, in the, because the budget well, it, falls. Yeah, well, yeah. budgeting, thank you. No, yeah, when one budget, about. one can only spend what money they have. The federal government can print more money. In Arkansas, we can. So when we have, um, you know, a thousand dollars, we can't spend 10,000. Uh, the federal government can. But in Arkansas, we have to balance our budget. So we don't have the revenue coming in. People lost their jobs. Sales taxes are down. People are not buying anything. You're sitting in your house. You're not spending money. So sales taxes are down, and our projected revenues don't cover what we budgeted for education. And we can only spend what we have. So we're not cutting taxes. The revenue that is generated to pay those things we just don't have the money. The good thing about it is, though, is education is on the top of the list to be funded. Yeah. So it's not like it's three or four right. rungs down the road. It's going to get the money that it's going to get. And like you said before, that can be a, a blessing. It can be a curse. You know, where it's going to be difficult to pull that money or to reduce the size of government. You know, when the budget or the balanced budget act itself says we have to spend everything we've got. Yeah, and if we get the money, get that. Yeah. if we get it, that'll be the that's the number one priority is education. So if we get that eleven million dollars mm -hmm. and that revenue comes in, 
we'll spend it. We're not going to try to cut it and not spend it. Right. Yeah. Uh, that's all the question for now. If we get some more questions, then I'll I'll just raise my hand and okay. ask them. Okay. Bob's got one. Uh, how come the balanced budget uh, requires for an all money to be spent? I mean, is there not a way to? Yes, we have. Yeah, we have a line item to go into long-term reserve. We have a line item for for savings of sorts, but uh, it depends on your political philosophy. Uh, you know, it's much more. We'd like to have all these nice, shiny things and do all these things. So it's easier when extra money comes in not to put it into a reserve. It's easier to spend it on um, other kinds of things. You know, we paid uh, $3 million we sent to Northwest Arkansas to build the theater. We didn't put that in highways. We spent $9 million to build the Sheriff's Museum in Fort Smith. Uh, we didn't put that in highways. Yeah. We spent uh, several million dollars to have the music highway, I think it's in Hoxie or over here somewhere, yeah. spent several million dollars on that. We didn't put it in education. We didn't put it in highways. So when we get more money, there's really an inclination of people to do things like that rather than to prioritize it and what our true, what I believe our true needs are. So coming back to holding our elected officials responsible the yeah. the money. Right. But that's also part of what we want because people do the same thing in their uh, own lives that we see them wanting for the, the government. You know, you get a check of, you know, or you get an extra $30. So you get, like, a lot of people have gotten like extra $1,200. I would be kind of interested in seeing how many of those people put 10% at least in savings before they spent the rest. And how many people, you know, didn't pay off the credit card bill or whatever because they took the opportunity to buy something that they'd always wanted. Mm -hmm. Because that's the way human beings are. Human Most basis, cases, right. it's a shiny bauble out here rather than something dull like savings or, you know, something else. So I think what we're doing is we're just asking the government to do the same thing that we do in our own private lives. Yeah, and you know, one of the things I'm really pushing on, and I, I will have several pieces of legislation, is to let us keep our money right here. We send money to Little Rock and then Little Rock mm -hmm. takes a percentage of it to process, then they send our own money back to us with strings attached. Now, why do we do that? Why don't we keep more of our money uh, and let us decide locally? Arkansas is one of the highest states in the nation for centralized spending. And why do we do that? It's a bad idea. Do you know when that began? I think in our Constitution. <laughs> <laughs> because I was just curious. But it, it just grows. I mean, every time you tax, you add a new tax, and we'll send it to Little Rock. We'll add a new tax. And as a rural state, it was probably, uh, there was a lot of necessity early on in our statehood to do that. We are a very rural state. And I'll, I'll give you an example. We take of the sales tax that we generate, we send all that sales tax, tax to Little Rock. They take 3%. Uh, for processing, um, and that came back in the 1970s, I think was when that bill passed, and it was all hand done. So I can understand doing all the math and people calculators, but now it's all electronic. You push a button, the money goes, you push another button, the money comes back. So why do we let Arkansas have that 3%? Why don't we cut it to 2%? Why don't we cut it for 1%? That doesn't affect the taxpayer. The taxpayer is saying, paying the same amount, mm -hmm. but the money stays here. Well, we don't do that because the state has found a use for your money down it's there. It's power, right. too, because the state yeah. can control yeah. what they want you to do. Yeah, yeah. a question for Senator-elect Sullivan. So, Senator-elect, why redirect funds? And this is from Derek Coleman. Why redirect funds if the money is meant for the situation? Why not just increase the program that the money is directed for? And that's from whom? Derek Coleman. And, okay, ask the question again now. It says, Senator-elect Dan Sullivan, why redirect funds if the money is meant for the situation? Just increase the program that the money is directed for. I guess he'd have to come and, I don't know where we're decreasing funds that we have the revenue for. We don't have the money. I can, I can, uh, if you don't have the money, how can you redirect it? Mm -hmm. We are... Derek, we are $353 million short between March and Ju June 30th. 
That's $353 million. We don't have it. So I don't know how we can redirect something that we don't have. Going into 2021, we are $212 million short. So I don't know how we redirect money that we don't have, but if Derek wants to call me, you know, let's sit down and... Uh, Senator, can we uh, get the number? I can post in the comments. Uh, okay. So what is your number and how, well, Senator, let me show you, I was from the Kayla can not my personal. Senator elect. Maybe I'm misunderstanding the question. Well, I didn't it's a difficult that. question to answer. Okay, uh, Senator uh, elect, what, what is that phone number that you can Eight seven zero. 275 275 2929 2929 Now, where do we get off here? I got my phone on silent, so I won't hear it. Okay, so <laughs> no, don't call me right now. Everyone watching. But I'd be glad up. to talk about it. I, I think, you know, we talk about redirecting money. You know, money ha is in a, in a column, and it can only be spent for what the government says it can be spent for. So if you're going to redirect it, you have to take it away from somebody to give it to somebody else because there's a finite dollar and people don't like you taking away their money. Um, you know, I'm sure the people that had the, that opened up the theater square in Northwest Arkansas got $3 million from the state. I wonder why they're not giving it back now that we're having this pandemic and need the highways. I wonder why they don't say, here, we're sorry, we'll give you your $3 million back. I wonder why they don't do that. Well, it's just as simple as you have to spend less because you have less coming in. Yeah, we can only spend what we have, but I, I mean, if he's got some ideas, I'm open for it. I think the biggest thing that I'm pushing for is let's keep our money right here. Why send it to Little Rock, they take some of it, and give us back our own money, and then tell us how to spend our own money. I think we can do a better job of it right here in our community. I see the I tax. Think people are going to take you up on your offer to call. <laughs> yeah. Well, Good. I mean, the, what you were talking about right then, right there, is, for instance, you know, the three percent that gets reduced at the state level, then Jonesboro could actually increase their tax right. that percent. Yes. It would be, be a even. wash for the key, for for mm -hmm. the citizens of Jonesboro, but the tax base that we were allowed to operate at Jonesboro would increase. Yeah, you know, the same thing is true. Our, our state sales tax, I think, is six point five percent. Right. And then our local city tax is one point one percent, and the county has a little bit in there. One. So if the state were to reduce their tax to six percent mm -hmm. and let us keep the five point five then the citizen, the per person who's paying their money, they don't even notice it, but we get to determine how we spend our money. Right. Now we have more accountability and we, we have more responsibility, good. The best government is the government that is local. Mm -hmm. So let us decide those things. I agree with that, it's Tea Party. Yeah. <clears throat> do you have anything to offer? Because if not, I want to ask y'all, what do you see coming down the road is our future. You know, we've had this pandemic, we've got millions, I don't remember now how many millions we have out of work, it was 22 million, more than that, out of work. <clears throat> this is April, no, this is May. Yeah. Where are, where do you see us being here in just a few months? Because we've got an election coming up in November, and I don't know about you, but I've talked to some people who are pretty much panic-stricken right yeah. now. I Not know. about the virus, about their economic situation. Well, and I, that, is probably the number one call that I get right now. Uh, single parents raising two, three children, uh, maybe they were a hairdresser or they were some kind of a contract laborer where in one day they were done. There's no money coming in. The uh, Department of Workforce Services uh, have been so overwhelmed with unemployment yeah. application benefits applications that their phone lines are not often answered or the uh, website crashes and they can't even fill out their application and Gayla lost her my wife lost her job at Dillard's with the tornado they were going to keep her on to do her job in spite of COVID-19 but then when the tornado hit it tore the roof off of the area where she works and so uh, I actually 
experienced, we did what a lot of our constituents are going through. Frustration, can't get through, just feeling like if I can't even download or get, get the application, I can never get started with the benefits. And so I had to, I would just tell everybody listening, download the application if you're still having trouble. You can fill it out and I wouldn't recommend that you go in necessarily to, to hand deliver it, but mail it in. Just drop it in the mailbox. We've got some great letter carriers that are still on the job and they're making sure that our mail is delivered every day. And do that, at least get in the system. And uh, I did go in and visit with uh, the management over at uh, Workforce Development and they sat me down and they just, they were telling me how many applications that they're having to manually key in every day. It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable the amount of work. So they're working more hours. They're, they're actually, they've actually become more efficient even though if you're working online or trying to call in, you think, what, where are these people? They're there, they're working, but they're having to do it under some really weird circumstances. But I see us in the future, some of our businesses may not come back. I hope Thanks. Millard's does it. Well, the, the pandemic, you know, where we're all locked inside, I thought, well, is it, then when Dillard's blew away, there wasn't any reason for me to leave. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. But, you know, I think <clears throat> some businesses will not come back. They right. will not rebound. Uh, and those employees, uh, they will need to begin looking for other employment, maybe in the same industry. Um, I don't think we're going to see... Uh, businesses outside of the continental United States like China want to come here for a while. I think that's going to be kind of We may of not a, have time for that, but I really wanted yeah. to get into that. Well, I think that's going to be a, I mean, they've already, Sun Paper's already pulled out of Arkadelphia mm -hmm. and that paper pulp mill plant down there, but um, I, I go back to, uh, I have a strong faith in, in God. And uh, Gail and I, we lived through the SARS epidemic or pandemic in China. We were in East Asia for almost 20 years. We lived through that. Uh, nothing ever seemed the same exactly after SARS cleared up. And so we may, we may have enough people that are fearful and have that post-traumatic stress from everything they've been going through and uh, it may take some time for them to feel better about life. I know even being out at Walmart or in other stores where we're now able to move around, people kind of look at you suspect, mm -hmm. you know, stay on your side of the aisle, you know, or they'll just pause. You're not following the little lines they have. Yes, I on the am. Floor, I'm a firstborn. I do everything <laughs> by the rules. Y'all, I didn't even see those arrows. I was just zipping down. Well, <laughs> Gayla didn't care like, about them either, and I kept saying, Gayla, uh, this is, you go in this aisle and you go there. She said, I don't even see those. Well, I, just, I didn't, literally did not see them because I'm just so focused on what I'm going to get. But, but yeah, you know, I, I, think, I think this goes back to some education and adult training and retraining and retooling. Mm -hmm. uh, some of these technical uh, programs like ASU Newport. Yes. We've seen that even in the midst of this, those essential services like linemen. Yes. Right. Surgical techs. Yes. You know, even though some were kind of laid off. We're going back to elective surgeries. Mm -hmm. They've got two-year programs over there. That are wonderful. That yes. when those young people and, and older adults that are still physically fit enough to go do those linemen things, they could be out earning good money in a short period of time. Trucking. Yes. Trucking um, yes. I, you know, I have I'm, to qualify it because my son-in-law is a dean down there at ASU Newport, but even before he was a dean down there, I used to tell my my high school students check into that if nothing yes. else you can go and get your basics for college yeah. your first two years much much cheaper and why pay more than you have to i'm a bargain hunter you know sure. forever but you know when he told me he said they can take the lineman uh uh training he said mm -hmm. and get started and it was like double what i was making as a teacher yeah. at that time and i thought yeah. 
If I could do that, I would. Yeah. Well, and they actually have yeah. those uh, students climbing poles. Yes. Right. Learning how yes. to use their gear exactly. strapped to a pole. They're so ready they to go to work job. once they get their, their That's certificate. That's exactly right. right. You know, so. I think one of the things that this, this has caused is people to really appreciate their freedom. Yes. And I think Arkansans are resilient and they love their freedom. And I think this has brought up, you know, good examples to telehealth bill. You know, we tried yes. for six years yes, to pass a telehealth bill and the medical lobby refused to let it pass. Oh, they now, killed it. They killed they it. They killed it. Yeah. And now all of a sudden we're all, we, we love telehealth. Uh, yeah. People want to be free. Uh, whether they're, whether it's a uh, curfew, whether it's choice of jobs, whether it's going to school, whether it's how I want to do my job, our people are creative. They're resilient. Uh, that's the spirit that God put in us. Yeah. And we will bounce back from this and we will have a strong economy. You know, we may have some of those businesses that went to China open up right here. Tom Cotton, Senator Cotton's working real hard on that right now. Uh, and others are too, to start industry right here in Arkansas to do those critical services that, and you hear the president talking about Move that. our pharmaceutical companies back. Oh, absolutely. Right? I mean, there's yeah. so, there so many opportunities, but it's gonna take government respecting the creativity and the freedoms, our personal freedoms that we have. Our government's gonna have to respect those when you've got the people in California who are going to the beaches yeah. and protesting their government, you, they're, whether they're right or not, I won't comment on, but they do have a new respect for personal freedom. Right. Well, and I think when you when innovation is something else. The, we may lose some jobs in Jonesboro, but when our, uh, Jonesboro is, is a hub for this area. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when we start getting these people that now feel freer to come in, I think, you know, the, the capitalist, you know, the capitalist model will work itself and when there is a need, there will be somebody to fill that need. You know, if we lose a few restaurants, you know, if they're continue to be packed, there's going to be somebody that's going to open up a new restaurant. There's going to be somebody that's going to fill those gaps. And I'm sort of interested to see what new innovations come out of this. Axe yeah. throwing, maybe. What, what, come on. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we've got two of those now. You know, who would fear, you know, but still, I, I'm sort of interested to see what innovations and what, um, what needs are, are going to come out of this and who's going to fill it and what, those, what that new business is going to look like. You know, and that's the freedom part of it. It is. Government has to allow people the freedom to be creative in how they um, run a business and what they can run and what they can do. And again, Arkansas is one of the most highly regulated mm -hmm. states mm -hmm. in the nation. Uh, you know, we talk about scope of practice, uh, letting nurses practice to the full scope of their licensure. Medical society has killed it. What a great opportunity. And someone asked the question about, you know, how do I move up that uh, job scale from where I am now moving up? Nursing is great. You can start with a two-year degree. You can get a four-year degree. You can get a six-year degree. You can open your own business if the medical society would allow that. Um, and the same thing is true as welding. You can start out as a low tech and move right on up. And I think those welders are making $90,000 yeah. a year. There's companies out there right now, industry, you know, that are working with our trade schools right yes. now. Mm -hmm. You know, and they say, what, do we, what type of skills do, are you going to need to supply the demand in the future? But welding, my gosh, some of these rail welding car. industry, yeah, yeah, rail car, they will take you in and train you to be a welder. Mm -hmm. you know, I know a guy right now that's going into pipe fitting. And you know, you get into school choice, you know, yes. with letting people, not just parents, but letting people choose the best way for them to be educated so that they can achieve a better life for themselves. And we have tended to let government decide, well, here's the only tracks you can take. I tell you another, I think it's a great idea. All of mine I think are good. <laughs> yeah, I've heard that. <laughs> you know, why, we have a, one of the greatest uh, arts facilities in Northeast Arkansas in the Forum. What a great activity they do. They could be giving you school credit in PE, in drama, in English. Art. In arts, in all the arts, they could be your child, you as a parent, or you as a child, could choose to go take your school credit right there. 
and use some of your educational tax dollar to fund that program. Now, someone asked earlier about redirecting. That's the kind of redirection I'm for because that allows the consumer the opportunity to decide what's best for them. And if people had an opportunity to say, well, I'm gonna to go to the forum and I'm gonna take my art credit there, mm -hmm. the forum goes to the Department of Education and gets licensed to do that, which isn't very hard. Uh, they have the curriculum and that would stimulate our economy and stimulate downtown. We might even have a bike trail down there. <laughs> All right, so uh, this is for Councilman Long. Uh, of course, earlier in the feed, uh, someone asked about uh, Andy Shetley and his run for mayor. So I think you probably know where this one's going. Are you running? <laughs> As of right now, I've not made that decision yet. Um, I think that there are a lot of opportunities um, for someone with the right temperament, with the right outlook, you know, that uh, I think would resonate with a lot of the people in Jonesboro right now. Um, but right now, I've not made that decision. It is something that I'm contemplating, though. When's the filing date? I have no idea. Isn't it some? Uh, I think it's, it's some July. July, July sometime, I think. Yeah. So there are some time. There are there. Are, there's a little bit of time, but that's just not my decision. You know, it's uh, my decision, my family's decision, and my wife, who's monitoring a little <laughs> thing back there. You know, she has a lot of pull. You know, and sway. But for but people yes. who don't know, we also have, I think, is it five or six councilmen who are coming up for re-election? Mm -hmm. There's six. It's half six. and half, yes. Right. And uh, so that's another, mm -hmm. that's another consideration. And people need to be too. aware of that because, you know, that's where we get our freedom by expressing our freedom to vote and making choices. And then we can hold people, you know, if we vote for Fred, then by Jiminy, we've got the right to say, Fred, I voted for you. And I think, you know, this is what an area I'm concerned about. So what are you going to yep. do about it? So And it's very important for you to know how your councilman votes on issues, on all the issues, just not on some, but on all of them. And do they voice their opinions yes. you know, when it comes up? Because that's one of the things that I feel really strong about is when people voice their opinions to me, I feel it is a responsibility to voice that opinion in a public forum. Or else I'm not doing my job as a representative. Yes, and it was very frustrating for those people who watched the city council meeting, this last one, to watch five councilmen sit there and essentially say, no, I think it was five. We had two councilmen besides the three that spoke against the curfew who made comments. And even if the comments are opposite of what I may think, I want people to express their opinion. That's what right. they're there for. Right. You know, that's why we have a free country. And you know, it's very frustrating for those of us who are citizens to watch people sit there like this, like they're bored, and yes, I'm going to say it, or to take a short nap during the meeting. <laughs> you know, I'm sorry. That, that to me is just not what you do on the council. So I, I want people to be involved. You know, we're a tea party. We are involved. We probably over-involved, according to a lot of people, but that's because we I did reach freedom. out to Mayor Perrin toward the end of that first two week block mm -hmm. on the curfew and I just I I told him I said look I think the people of Jonesboro want to do the right thing we're practicing safe measures but you've got people that feel their civil liberties are being infringed and please do not extend the curfew and I, I even, even in my text, uh, I mentioned, I know you want to run for a, another term. This could be a deal breaker mm -hmm. for you. And of course, they extended the curfew anyway. Well, so, it was not a, it, well, there was multiple things that was wrong with that. I think that one of the major issues people have with it was that the reasons being given didn't yes, line up. Didn't line up. A curfew is a curfew for a reason, but when you have so many exemptions of why you could be out, it's not a curfew anymore. Exactly. There was absolutely nothing keeping from the entire city of Memphis driving over here and being on our streets from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. if they were going to fill up the gas right. tank, if they were going to do this, if they were going to do that. They were going. Nothing would stop them from being on our streets, and yet it would do absolutely nothing. So the reasons that were being given did not line up with what was what was actually being done. You know, I think there would I think there would have been a lot more support for it 
you know, had the reasoning just been laid out there for what it really was, I don't know what it really was. Well, we had the support after but, the tornado. Yes. Well, yes, and that was something else, but that was a temporary thing. Yes. Right. That was a temporary thing, and I remember the amendment, you know, to, uh, he wanted to extend it for six months, well, for 120 days. Right. All right, and uh, we had had a discussion about that, and, I, and he said uh, something like, you know, right, now, right then, uh, at the time, it was 48 hours that the city council had right. to convene in order to approve it. You know, we talked about it, and I said, I'm not going to go 120 days. I will go to the next scheduled <clears throat> council meeting, and it has to be re-upped every, every two weeks. You know, well, you know, there was the opportunity. You know, the minute it was, it was approved, we had the curfew. But then, you know, you got to thinking the curfew was lifted. I would like to know, you know, what happened in between that one week that changed so much? You know, from one one press conference, it was PPE. We didn't have enough PPE. One thing is, surely there's packing slips involved to where we have all of this PPE shown to where it just flooded ourselves. Now we've got all that we need and we can lift the curfew. You know, so I, there, it just didn't match up, and people realized it. Yes, and they don't like feeling like they're the, being duped or they're exactly. being told not and to. And that was thing. a big thing. But you know, there were a huge number of people that contacted me that wanted the curfew because of the crime, and I had to remind them the curfew is not because of the crime. The curfew has been exactly. stated it was because of the virus, and people were abs actually confused. There were a lot of people who were confused about that. We always, we will always have crime. Right. You know, we cannot get rid of the crime. Just like we cannot com continue to stay indoors thinking that the virus is going to go away. The virus may not go away. Crime is not going to end. We cannot have a curfew or limit people's freedom to assemble and to move about like they want to freely just because we might stop one break-in or stop one group of teenagers from congregating on a parking lot after 10 p.m. Well, I think, too, that people have been very much terrified by a lot of the stories. They've been very affected by heartrending stories about people who've had it. But when you look at the numbers in Craighead County, now this was as of last night. I didn't listen to the things today. We've had 81 cases. We've had no deaths because our one death was actually reassigned to Missouri. And that gives us, just listen to the percentage, 0.000. .000 I don't have a glass on six one. That's the percentage, and that's just in Craighead County. That's one one thousand. It's 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 incredible, and but people have been so terrified mm -hmm. because they're not giving the percentages. Um, in the case of Arkansas, it's almost incalculable the percentage that are actually right. affected. And once again, you know, and I have done this research ever since this started to look at the actual facts, and like everything else those people who are most affected are over 65. As a matter of fact, the ones who are most affected are over 85. And underlying health conditions. And underlying health conditions. Yes. And it's just, but even so, somebody that's 80 years old only has a, a let's see, what is a 13% chance of fatality even if they get it. Now that's based on, everything I look at is not, is always CDC stats. Yeah. Or Worldometer, or even uh, WHO. We've overreacted. We overreacted. And seriously. I don't mean that. I'm not saying that flippantly. Exactly. Because I respect the the right. medical field. Exactly. But we could have, and this is the same thing with going back to the mayor's uh, curfew. We could have communicated the reason or rationale yes. much truth. better. Yeah. And uh, I mean. I keep saying, you know, we've lived overseas for years. We have been in war zones. We've been in pandemics. We've seen mudslides, floods that nobody could envision that this thing would happen. We we missed the tsunami in Thailand by just a few days. Mm -hmm. And so we've been close to all of these catastrophes. But you can't just let it immobilize you as a person. You know, you have to pick yourself up. You know, keep your faith strong. Spend spend a little more time in prayer, but get moving 
and just trust that God is still in control. And mm-hmm. use some common sense because that's it. You know, we well, have had. Well, I know this affects a lot of people. You know, we're not question. making a lot of. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so, so right now, the measures have been taken to flatten the curve, and they've been proven to be pretty successful. But what steps on the state and on the local level uh, are you all prepared to do if there is a winter spike? in viruses, would it mean advocate for maybe going back to some of the measures put in place as far as some of the restrictions? Well, or what, what would happen going forward if later on down the line there's another huge increase of cases? Well, uh, let me go on the local level first. And there's something that when Dr. Spikes, mm-hmm. Spikes was giving his presentation to the city council, I asked him a couple of questions that spoke to that. Flattening the curve seems to be a really good catchphrase and people like using it. But when I asked him, when he looked at the graph, flattening the curve has nothing to do with preventing people from getting the virus. It has everything to do with spreading out the time frame that people get the virus. And not overwhelming the hospitals. And not overwhelming the hospital systems. And we didn't even come close to overwhelming the hospital systems. I firmly believe that back in the fall when people were thinking they had the flu, but they were going and getting tested for the flu, and they didn't have it, that they possibly could have had this. You know, so flattening the curve is good, but it's not going to prevent people. And let me tell you something, the people of Jonesboro are not dumb people. They're smart. They know that if they have an underlying health condition, or if they're older, that it may be to their best advantage to stay, take, home. To stay home or to go to the stores when there's few people or, or to, do to those take an option, have them delivered or to pick them up at sure, Kroger's. Yes. Well, see, so that them. goes to that creativity. Exactly. That we've seen. Yes. And the businesses came up and, and did that. And they people. did it. And well, they, they were if, if the creative. questioner wants us to project what we would do, it will not be the same landscape. We no. have, they're working on vaccines. We will have identified the most at risk populations. We will have identified whether a curfew works. We will have identified specific actions that we can take that we don't know of right now. So I think it's, you know, I'm not prepared to say, well, we're gonna go, we're gonna have mass curfews, we're gonna have, close all the restaurants down. We may have better activities. We may know all of us old people need to stay home and we'll stay home. Uh, People, we may, the government may come to trust the people more. Uh, Let's hope so. And, and let know. us handle our situation. So you know, it's really difficult to say what we'll do because we're not, you know, the old saying is you never step in the same river twice because the water's flowing. You never answer a pandemic the same way twice. Well, and we'll we, have a lot of hindsight. Yeah, you know, we, that we, we, do. we, can we know didn't have when this started. We'll be able to say, look, this didn't work. This was too financially catastrophic for the country and things like that. You I know what can we can that. say? We can say with confidence that the people of Jonesboro yes. will, will work together mm-hmm. to resolve whatever the problem is. That's one thing we've seen from this, is that our people are willing to work together. Yeah, we rallied behind yeah. each other. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And Even during really the tornado when all this was going on. Yes. Yeah. 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 It's a lot of fear. And, I'm, I'm, and it's difficult when fear grips you. And you talked about it before. You know, we're, God created us to be free people. And God created us with a creativity and a desire to help one another and love one another. And you know, we heard all the time, we want to be like Northwest Arkansas. We want to be like these guys. Folks, there's nowhere better than Jonesboro, Arkansas and Craighead County, where people care for and love one another and willing to do what it takes to care for us. And you can be confident that if we do have a spike, whatever that reason is, that's the one consistent thing that we'll continue to see. Yeah, I agree. And uh, I ask him also, you know, with people staying in place and with people distancing from one another. I talked to him about a, a concept, herd, uh, herd immunity. Mm-hmm. I talked to him about uh, different things like that, about you know, when we do get back together, I think we should expect a little bit of uptick. But I think another thing that's gonna be different <clears throat> is the fact that we'll have a lot of people out there that have contracted it, that have built up antibodies that no longer can get it or Give it. It's part of that herd immunity. So I think that that's going to be something that's going to be, you know, significant as well. But you know, when people look at this, I'm I'm hearing young people that were at, at first they were like, you know, good. I don't want to give it. I don't want to do this. Now they're like, their mental health <clears throat> and just their attitude on life has diminished so much that now they're to the point to where they're saying, you know what. 
I'm just ready to face it, get it, deal with it, and go on with my life. And that's something life. a lot of people didn't because consider. Because I was not built yeah. to live under a rock. Exactly. And, you that, know, you know we, we've talked about what the virus does, but we haven't talked a lot in this country about the effects of this total isolation, the suicide, the increase in suicide. So we'll have numbers on that Child later. abuse. Child abuse, spousal abuse. Um, yeah, a uh, dozen uh, things. an attorney had mentioned recently to Gayla and me that uh, as soon as this is over, their, uh, their workload will increase exponentially right. for couples seeking divorce. Right. Yeah, They're that, already gearing up for it. Yeah. Another good outcome is people are not watching Netflix right now. They're tuning in here. And they don't have to watch a long movie. They've got something new. Which brings me to the point that, you know, yeah. I promised people about an hour and we're already 20 oh, yeah. minutes over that. Oh. And But I have enjoyed this and I have enjoyed having good. you three here. This has just been wonderful. And I'm hoping that we can do this again, not yeah. just during a pandemic, but, you know, other times just have kind of a forum like this. Yeah, folks, give me about 30 minutes to get home. <laughs> <You're going laughs> <to stop. laughs> Yeah, if, if anybody wants to call me, I'm going to give you Dan's number. <laughs> well, it's already posted in the comments, so. Oh, thank you. <laughs> well, we're going to make all that information available to on our Tea Party website. So. Yeah. Um, what, a, what a great thing that for people to participate tonight. And we so much appreciate that. You know, one of our goals as legislators is to meet with more people and expand what our constituency is and the people that know us and engage with us. Yeah, that's what we're supposed to be doing. So you know, we welcome those opportunities and uh, you know, hope we can have a meeting at a restaurant pretty soon. That would be fun. And well, I'm, I'm going to look forward to that too, especially because I love eating at Hills because yeah. I've got a buffet. <laughs> I, <laughs> I do want to thank everybody for showing up for this and for watching. And I really want to thank KLEK for doing this. Yeah. This is the man that knows all about this because I don't think anybody else in this room knew how to do this. So uh, we really appreciate KLEK and always yeah. have. Well, thank you all. This is what we do. We educate, we entertain, and we empower. Uh, like you all, I believe it's important that citizens are informed on what their elected officials are thinking, and we're happy to bring this opportunity again. We don't, we don't tell people how to think. We just put it out there, and and it's been a good dialogue in the comments. So we yeah, we appreciate the opportunity. Awesome. Thank, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Bye, everybody. Bye. Right. This is Kelly K. One hundred two point five FM.